The confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh was a bruising episode for many Americans. Today's guest views that confirmation process against the long history of America's courts and essential debates over the constitutional limits on executive power. He's Jed Sugarman this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, filmmakers, authors, journalists, and scholars, to help make sense of the big story shaping public life in the United States today. This week, we're joined by Jed Sugarman, a professor of law at Fordham University. Jed, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So you have a sort of re a remarkable educational background, and I want to begin there. You've got uh, both a JD and a PhD in history from Yale University. That's a lot of education. <laughs> what, what, what led you to that? Uh, so I was really interested in both history and um, getting into uh, criminal defense work or public policy work. And so I thought I had to decide between the two. And I sh at, when I finally decided on law school, I, I show up and I find that all the questions I'm interested in are the historical questions. And I discover that those historical questions are highly relevant to the way that cases get decided in America. So partly it's uh, the originalism, the turn to originalism in the courts relies on historical scholarship. Um, so the point is that uh, history actually addresses a lot of the basis for modern constitutional law. So does does that does, does that perspective sort of permeate law as a field, or are you sort of an outlier? Uh, I think that everyone who studies law uh, has has to have some historical background, yeah. and for some areas of law, history is one of the touchstones. So you mentioned uh, sort of originalism. What? T talk to us about some of the big concepts that come out of our history that continue to shape the way we think about jurisprudence today. So uh, the originalism is the idea that uh, the that the uh, the original ideas or purposes of the founding fathers, or the framers of the Constitution, uh, are the basis for interpreting the Constitution. And so you have a, a political split today where conservatives insist that they are truly committed to the original meaning of the Constitution and they portray the left as just being engaged with living constitutionalism and essentially making things up the way they want. Legislating uh, they, through the Legislating courts. through the bench and uh, uh, just ju uh, judging for results, um, doing policy but dressed up in robes. And I think that's, a, that's an unfair characterization. Uh, just like conservatives have their favorite moments from the founding era, uh, many liberals and progressives should be more willing to look back and say, oh, the founding era had a bunch of ideas that we should embrace, th things that were originally their conception of anti-corruption, for example. So a lot of the original history that I'm working on is about uh, is the, the founding, f the framing of the Constitution as an anti-corruption document, um, as a document of democratic engagement, and, and uh, also the idea of um, limits on presidential power. So some of our historical research now shows that we've overlooked the way that the, fa the framers put into the Constitution fiduciary limits, uh, ethical limits, on the misuse of presidential power. One more moment in American history that many people, when they talk about originalism, overlook. It's not just like the entire Constitution was written at one moment of 1787. It was also amended. And some of our most important parts of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment about equality and due process and privileges and immunities for all citizens, those are also part of the Constitution. What did the writers of those texts mean with their values of equality and due process? So if the founders could return today, and I realize there were a number of them and they would have had different opinions, but in general, what do you think they would view 
or what would be their view of originalism as discussed today? Well, I think they'd be shocked by many things. I mean, they look at, they see a metal tube in the sky, and they, what is that thing flying in the air? How is that possible? It right? still shocks me that it could actually <laughs> yes. fly, to be honest. So part of the challenge is trying to, uh, the notion that, we, that originalism means reanimating the founders and saying, well, what would they think of X, Y, or Z, right? And in fact, some of the conservatives on today's Supreme Court um, actually make fun of originalism. So Justice Alito said, you know, uh, in a case about um, uh, the Fourth Amendment rights against search and seizure, when they were talking about cell phones, you know, what would Madison say about a cell phone or about, about violent video games? So even some of the conservatives are skeptical of the idea that we would ask the founders what they thought of X, Y, or Z. And I think that's really important. The, the originalism does not mean anymore, or shouldn't mean, what were the original expectations on practical policy questions? You know, what would Hamilton think about violent video games? Um, I think the, the, the idea is to take their big, big picture views, their purposes, why they wrote the Constitution. So the way that I frame this is um, we've all moved away from, I think, narrow originalism, meaning the, ex the, the, the specific expectations of the founders, to broad originalism, the purposes, the general purposes. So I think if you brought them back today, they, I frankly think that they would look at Donald Trump and they would say, this is actually why we designed an electoral college. We wanted a system of electors, not direct democracy, so that we brought together our leaders from all over the country. They would come to the electoral college and they'd say, this is a demagogue. Right? And I think that that was the original plan of the Hamilton electors. The ha when Hamilton wrote about the Electoral College, he thought about virtue and the idea that you would have leadership stand in the way of a demagogue. So that's one example of, I think, something we've lost so, well, from the original. Well, and that, this raises an issue, right? Because the, the, the engineering of that system has not kept pace with how it's actually right. used in practice. And so uh, where does that leave us? We sort of have the artifacts of this constitutional system, but it does not operate. We didn't anticipate the power of party, right? The founders didn't anticipate right. the power of party. And the, 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 the reforms in the, uh, the election of electors and how electors behave does, is not true to right. what the founders intended. And part of that is that pol uh, political institutions will evolve. So the one question is, what do our institutions, how do our institutions evolve that go beyond what the constitutional design was? versus what do courts do? So there's no, I don't think there's any unwinding of the Electoral College. I think right. the Electoral College was set in motion and the founders had one notion of what it should do and, and over 230 years, it's evolved into something else. Yeah. Fine, there's, I don't think there's any way to, to bring the Electoral College back. The next question is, what are the areas where judges can intervene? And so another topic, so I have, um, so I have two co-authors at Fordham and we've been digging into the history of the faithful execution clauses. So there are two parts of the Constitution that have gotten overlooked um, uh, in, uh, in terms of this phrase. One is that there's a very important phrase called the take care clause and it says the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And that's a very important clause, but everyone emphasizes the take care part as if the president has a special power. They ignore what the faithful execution uh, words mean. The second place it comes up is that the presidential oath is spelled out. It's the only oath spelled out in the Constitution. And that oath is that the president uh, takes an oath that he will faithfully execute the office. So people have thought that those words were just flowery, hortatory, religious language, sort of a, but really what was going on, what we've, what we've put our finger on in the historical documents, is that that phrase faithful execution had concrete legal meaning in the late 18th century. Um, it, was, it came from 800 years of English statutes back to the Magna Carta, the original English constitution of limited power. They used the phrase faithful execution to tell an office holder to limit their discretion, that you can't go beyond the powers that you've been given, and you have to use your powers in good faith. That's what faithful execution means. So what we're arguing in this paper is that courts should, uh, when courts look at that uh, language, that leads them to, that should lead them to limit the president's power to pardon himself. It should limit the president's power to pardon co-conspirators. Should limit the president's power to uh, remove people investigating him when he's trying to to protect himself. And it also means that the president has to follow through on statutes, which has an impact on Obamacare, the ACA. The president can't sabotage the ACA because he doesn't like it. That's not faithfully executing the law. On the flip side, 
Uh, it also means that when Obama had different views on, on how to implement the ACA or on immigration policy, he was sometimes not faithfully executing the law. So, this, so it's important for us to look at the Constitution in good faith and understand that sometimes these interpretations will sometimes cut against the left and, and the Democrats and sometimes cut against well, the right. So what role, I'm thinking of uh, the role of signing statements and the signing of big sort of, you know, right. the defense author authorization bill each year, the president will, and it's been going on for a number of, of administrations now, they issue a signing statement that <coughs> says not how they intend to interpret, but how they intend to implement exactly. the law. That seems to be at odds with what you're describing. It's exactly right. That's a great example. So when statute, when Congress passes a statute, they have written out all the the words and their meaning of what the what of what the statute's supposed to do. And the president, from Reagan to Clinton to George W. Bush to Obama to Trump, they've all, I think, abused the process of these signing statements is, well, Congress said this, but we're going to ignore this piece, or I'm going to interpret this piece differently. Now, sometimes the presidents have the power to have this discretion to interpret and apply the law with, pros for example, prosecutorial discretion has to be something that a president has when given a statute. But these signing statements, you're exactly right. They do something very different. They're not just about priorities or resources. They're about a president basically amending or overriding a statute despite the fact that he signed it just a minute ago, yeah. right? I think it's a, uh, it's a huge problem that we're addressing here. So we have just witnessed the uh, confirmation process for Judge Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court, and he was confirmed and appointed. What did you make of that process? The hearings and the FBI investigation, I'll put quotes around that, I think. Right. What did you make of all that? And I realize the discussion here could be lengthy, but in, in general, your overview. Well, let's take w one big step back and look at the Gorsuch nomination with the Kavanaugh nomination. The, um, I think a lot of people are very critical of how Gorsuch got confirmed because it was a seat that was held up. And I think there's actually two sides to that debate. I mean, one is that if the Republicans had control of the Senate, they used that power to block the nomination of Garland um, and leave a seat open. And in some ways, you can say that Mitch McConnell uh, played more of a role than anyone else in America in getting Trump elected. By leaving Scalia's seat open, he made sure that many evangelicals who, were, uh, who would otherwise stay home made sure to vote for Trump, not to vote for Trump, but to vote for Scalia's seat. So, so in some ways, I think there, it's, it's, it's an important point to, re to recognize that there's a democratic process that even though there may have been co conspiracy and collusion to get Trump the election, many of his voters mobilized for that purpose. That's different, I think, from the Kavanaugh appointment because at that point, we had more concrete, direct evidence of Trump's criminal activities. We've never in American history ever had a president con nom nominate and confirm a justice in the middle of facing direct, concrete evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, so that Andrew Johnson, who was president in, uh, after the Civil War during Reconstruction, he was impeached. He never appointed a, a Supreme Court justice. Nixon, after Watergate, went and, and never appointed a justice. Clinton in the middle of the, the, in his second term, when, the, when there was more concrete evidence. You know, the first term, there was an investigation, but nothing concrete had come up. But once concrete evidence was on the table, that was arguably a high crime and misdemeanor. No justices re retired. So we had a tradition of no justices retiring in the middle of such a constitutional crisis. Anthony Kennedy needs to be looked at as someone who failed his responsibility in the middle of a constitutional crisis in retiring and Congress failed its duty in allowing a president facing impeach, you know, who is going to be facing impeachment um, in being able to appoint a justice, any justice, but all the more so, a justice who was picked, I think it's clear, because he has views of expanding presidential power. Right? It's not just, you can find a lot of judges who will overturn Roe v. Wade, but the thing that was uh, remarkable about Kavanaugh's record is how much he endorses expanding presidential power. And that, to me, is, the, is a com that, those in combination, before you even get to Dr. Ford and the FBI investigation, mm -hmm. made this appointment illegitimate. So you just sort of, you know, all sorts of, there's a lot to unpack from what you just there said. There really is. But the, 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 the idea that we are currently in a constitutional crisis Expand on that a little bit for us. I think we're in a crisis that, um, because it's a crisis of the institutions, right? It's, it's, uh, our crisis is partly that the, when the framers put together the Constitution, 
as you were just saying, Jim, that the notion that um, that they didn't understand, that they didn't uh, foresee the parties playing the same role that they do today. Um, the, the we've had so much partisanship uh, on on both sides uh, that Congress now doesn't do its job in being a, in being a check on investigating the presidency, right? Investigating Trump. So what this creates is a crisis where co where the design of the Constitution is not. Uh, being followed through on by the people holding those offices. Trump is not being investigated yet uh, for, the cr for the crimes that we now see clear evidence of. Um, and that creates a constitutional crisis because we have uh, a president engaged in high crimes and misdemeanors without a che without checks without real checks and balances. Can you, can you be some, give us some specific examples of the kinds of high crimes and misdemeanors you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I'll be very clear. So, so there are two, I think um, there are two sets of, of, well, there are really three pieces to the conspiracy allegations. Um, one piece is the, are the, uh, the collusion in the middle of the 2016 election, um, which I think we have concrete evidence now uh, that, of, of that kind of uh, collusion. And in terms of the crime, the, the statute that, one, you know, you don't need to have a statute. A high crime and misdemeanor is not limited to felonies on the books. They right. can be abuses of power. So, uh, but it, there is a statute called the Conspiracy uh, to Defraud the United States in its basic functions. It's a statute called 18 U.S.C. 371. Um, basically, m several people have, have pleaded guilty to that. So the question is, um, Mueller is investigating the events at Trump Tower in, uh, in June of uh, 2016, and immediately while that was happening, Trump said, you know, um, you're going to see a big speech coming up about Hillary Clinton and all the things going on with the email. Yeah. Well, he gave, he gave that announcement one hour after the meeting in Trump Tower had been planned. It is implausible that he gave that speech to, uh, uh, to the American public one hour after this, this meeting was planned. So there's the events. I'd say one bucket um, are the conspiracy charges that are, sp uh, that are being substantiated between June of 2016, then saying, you know, Russia, if you're listening, now that we know more about what was happening between June and July, that's, that's one uh, bucket of, uh, of criminal conspiracy concerns. Then we now know more about, after, immediately after the election, what Flynn was involved with, with Kushner and Don Jr. and, and the engagement with Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates and perhaps Qatar with the secret line. So that's December of, of 2016. We're looking at more concrete evidence of that of a conspiracy in the middle of those events. And then the third bucket is obstruction of justice. And I've argued in, in writing uh, that w what Trump already said he did on national TV, that he firing, uh, firing Jim Comey because of the Russia investigation is already sufficient evidence uh, for obstruction of justice, uh, plus everything else he said around that. So, so when I talk about high crimes and misdemeanors, I'm, I'm referring to three uh, events in the past two years with concrete evidence already in the public square. So that's a very convincing case that you have made here. Why does a significant percent of the American population either not believe this or disregards it, meaning they don't care and there are more important things? Why? I mean, it's kind of hard to listen to that and and not say <laughs> there's something there. Um, I think we one factor I think about is how um, this moment is different from Watergate, right? So I, I I'll, I'm always kind of putting the Trump timeline of the Trump presidency and matching it up with what we knew about Watergate and and how Watergate unfolded. And one big picture difference between Watergate and 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 this era is that we had the Cold War. And I think many Americans understood that a weakened presidency was an existential mm. crisis. That because we were a superpower, but in, in tension in, in the middle of Vietnam and, and, a, and a global contest with, with Russia. I, interestingly, Russia comes back into play here, but as the, op as the opposite reason. I think that there was less patience um, for Nixon uh, weakening the presidency because so much more was at stake. At this point in 2018, there, don't get me wrong, there are problems around the world, but we don't face any challenge uh, in, in an existential way the way we did then. The, there's a second piece, too, which is that the, partisan, the partisanship has changed. Um, the Republican Party had wings. It had a moderate, it had a much more moderate, liberal, pro-civil rights wing in the, in the late 60s and 70s, um, and it had a more you know, conservative Cold War wing. But the, the Democrats also had uh, a, a split. The, the Democrats had conservative uh, Southern Democrats who supported Nixon. 
So the thing that happened in Watergate was that Nixon's base of support, you know, the, the base of support in the Democratic Party left him because they were part of the Democratic Party at the, at the end of the day. And the liberal, moderate Republicans left him. And then some of the very Cold War, you know, anti-Russia conservatives also had, uh, gave up on, on Nixon too. Um, so Nixon's public support went down into the, into the 20s when Watergate really blew up. I think that Trump has sort of locked in 35, he can't go below 35% because of the way that the parties have realigned um, ideologically and, um, and don't process information the way they did uh, 40 years ago. So it seems like the Mueller investigation uh, is, um, uh, is, 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 all of these arguments are going to be relevant to whatever comes of, of the investigation at the end of the day. Um, but fundamentally, you're asserting that the president does not have the authority to pardon himself or even to the people who are close to him. Have the courts grappled with this at all? This, is, this particular textual argument is a new argument. based on, It's a new argument based on really old sources. So it's, um, what we've done is we've dug into centuries and centuries of statutes and centuries and centuries of cases to show that this was the background that the framers were writing about. It's just that we haven't had a president who's challenged these norms like this in American history. Um, when, when, uh, when there was a possibility that there was this conflict with Nixon, Congress, was, Congress started doing its job. It was, had hearings and subpoenas, and, and, and then when Ford pardoned Nixon, uh, but Nixon didn't pardon himself, we didn't have that conflict, and Nixon didn't pardon his co-conspirators. So the courts have never faced this particular controversy. Um, but there are questions of when pardons have been invalid. So, for example, when Bill Clinton, I mean, this is really a bipartisan problem. Yeah. When Bill Clinton pardoned Mark Rich, who was a big donor to, to Democrats at the end of Clinton's term? There was a long, there's a one-year investigation for why, for what Clinton, why Clinton pardoned this Democratic donor. Now, one question is, can a president pardon someone but then face bribery? You know, will the pardon, will the pardon be valid? But then the president faces a, a bribery con, uh, prosecution. But I think that's that what we're arguing is there's another step, which it's not just punishing the abuse of that power for bribery for or for obstruction of justice, but that the pardon itself can be invalidated uh, because it's not the faithful execution of the of the laws or a faithful execution of the office. So we should note that we're in in the middle of the fall of 2018 and a lot of these events are still yet to play out but were the president to be in a position where he could self pardon himself and were he to do that what would the reaction be do you think from from the American public from Congress and from the courts? I'm not sure for the reasons we just talked about. Um, I think that there is a sufficient, there's a significant number in his base that really has bought the line that this is a witch hunt, despite all of the guilty pleas, <laughs> right? I mean, at, at a certain yeah. point, a, a witch hunt starts to look like, okay, wait, there are real witches out there. A lot there. of witches. <laughs> a lot of yeah. witches. If we've got, uh, if we've got something up, you know, building up to something like, you know, eight major guilty pleas or so, you know, that we're, we're at almost at that stage now. Um, so I think there would be a backlash. Um, but I can't really predict. I, I, I thought that at a certain point, a number of things would happen where Trump would lose um, public support. I think the key thing now is um, less, I think if, if Trump were to pardon himself, I think there'd be a backlash for a couple of days, just like Trump standing up on stage with Putin and, and, act, and acting so subservient to Putin, that was a storm and it went away. I think the game changer might be when Mueller has hard evidence, not of just obstruction of justice. I actually don't think obstruction, it, obstruction of justice concerns have already been priced into our political calculus, right? I think people already acknowledge that Trump uh, is a bull in a china shop and yeah. obstruction of justice is one thing. If there is hard evidence of conspiracy between Trump and Russian assets, or hard evidence that um, Jared Kushner is compromised by Saudi Arabia and by United Arab Emirates and, and Qatar, and then that goes back to Trump himself. I think that might start changing people's minds, but ultimately I think this is gonna have to be resolved at the ballot box. I, I, uh, my concern is that even if, if, if Mueller finds the, the things that we kind of expect him to find, I mean, if he finds something explosive, that's one thing, but I think at this stage, I, I'm not confident that, uh, that um, that uh, the Senate Republicans would vote to remove him given even hard evidence of conspiracy and crimes. I think it's gonna be resolved the ballot box in so 2020. I've got about uh, two more hours worth of questions that we'd like to run by you. <laughs> We've only got about two minutes left in the show. Right. Uh, but let me ask you this one. Um, uh, 
you know, we've described here sort of a constitutional system that's not working the way it was engineered. And I hear mostly from sources on the right talk and rumors about a need for a new constitutional convention. What do you think about that idea? Uh, I would rather talk about amendments, but even amendments are too. I, I, I'm concerned that uh, if, if we were worried about disinformation campaigns and dark money and, and, and light money, you know, all kinds of money in our elections, I'd be worried that if we had a constitutional convention with a series of elections that you'd have a lot of money pouring in. I think we have a, we have a tradition. The Constitution has holes in it. There are gaps. But overall, it's been an amazing document that survived uh, so many different challenges in our history. It would be a shame to lose that history that survived so long. And I really, even if I've got concerns about our polity right now and, and public opinion, I really believe this constitutional framework will survive Trump and will actually help constrain Trump. So 30 seconds, your next project is looking at mass incarceration. Yes. 30 seconds. Um, how did prosecutors go from being a nothing office in America in the 19th century to being the stepping stone for big politics and, and get running for president? Um, that happened in the mid 20th century, and it also leads prosecutors to be too aggressive in putting people in prison to make their political names. That's how we get mass incarceration over the last and generation. And that is a clear social injustice. Yes. Yes, it is. Jed Sugarman, there's so much more we <laughs> wanted to talk to you about. We'll have to have you back. Thank you so much for being with us. Sure, He's Jed Sugarman. One of his books that we didn't talk about, The People's Courts, is definitely worth your read. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>